Thank you all. Thank you, Yafe. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. May peace and blessings be on all of you. I'm honored and delighted to take part in this symposium honoring Duncan Black MacDonald on the 150th anniversary of his birth. My task is to offer an assessment of his views on Jewish thought. And my remarks are based on two books published toward the end of MacDonald's life and career. The Hebrew Literary Genius, subtitled An Interpretation Being an Introduction to the Reading of the Old Testament, published in 1933, and The Hebrew Philosophical Genius, A Vindication, published in 1936. Both were issued by Princeton University Press. The latter was reissued in 1965 by Russell and Russell Incorporated in New York. As we heard when Professor Michel introduced our exhibition earlier, he wrote a third volume, The Hebrew Religious Genius, which was not published, at least not yet. A manuscript of this book here in the exhibition is on display, and it seems to be, as Professor Michel observed, the third volume of a trilogy. And I hope to read it once the fragile pages are scanned and I have access to the material. Today I'm confining my comments to the two volumes which appeared in the 1930s. It took a great deal of courage on McDonald's part to write and publish these two volumes at a time when Nazi Germany was gaining power in Europe and viciously persecuting Jews, while here in the United States, the anti-Semitic and pro-fascist radio broadcasts of Father Charles Coughlin were reaching tens of millions of listeners and poisoning public discourse. According to a personal letter cited for me by Professor Yachir Michaud, McDonald himself wondered whether anyone outside the Jewish literary world would take these books seriously. The honorary doctorate awarded him by the Jewish Theological Seminary in 1937, a copy of which is in the library, reflects how his efforts were appreciated by at least part of the Jewish establishment of that time. In the Jewish Quarterly Review in April 1936, Joshua Finkel wrote a very favorable assessment of the Hebrew literary genius and included this, these lines from McDonald's book, page 96. Behind the book, this means the Hebrew Bible, there are, of course, the documents, E, J, P, and the rest, of our documentary analysts. We are not concerned with these, he said. McDonald. Still further behind the book is a wealth of folklore tradition and story of the most multifarious origins. We are not concerned with it. But we are concerned with the phenomenon of the book as it stands there on the opening pages of our own Old Testament. A single, unified, great literary phenomenon postulating a great literary creator. End of quote for McDonald. And Finkel adds, these sentences in a way epitomize the book. By masterfully unfolding this basic thought, McDonald has established a new school for biblical study. He says, I, Finkel, shall venture to call it the Gestalt School because of its affinities with Gestalt psychology. Like it, it postulates its, its distinctive axiom that, quote, the whole is more than its parts and is prior to them, end quote. Like it, it stands for configuration as against atomistic construction and direct examination of experience as against taking the material piecemeal. I don't know, and I wish I did, how widely McDonald's writings on the Hebrew scriptures were studied decades ago in Christian seminaries when his books were issued, at least outside this one. It's worth exploring, I would submit, and if there are records available, such as course syllabi in biblical studies or book reviews in Christian journals back in the 1930s and 40s, I would love to see them. Now, we've acknowledged that McDonald, like any one of us, was influenced by the era in which he lived and we by the era in which we live now. 
even as McDonald wrote these two books to refute some deeply ingrained and prevalent prejudices against Jews, Judaism, and even the Hebrew Bible, he himself conveyed in his writings negative, sometimes harshly negative, views about Jews, Judaism, and even the Hebrew Bible. Views which were part of wider Christian culture, including the academy. We all know the tragic consequences resulting from Christian supersessionism and the demonizing of Jews over many centuries. Before the Second Vatican Council and its historic Nostra Aetate Declaration in October 1965, through the teachings of pseudo-anthropologists in the 19th and 20th centuries, this theological anti-Judaism morphed into racialist anti-Semitism with dehumanizing and murderous results. McDonald did not subscribe to such virulent ideologies, but he did harbor cultural and theological views that affirmed the superiority of Christian faith and culture, and that denigrated Jews and Judaism, along with Arabs and Islam, reflecting a classically orientalist stance toward the East, mainly the Near or Middle East, that could perhaps fairly be called anti-Semitic in the literal sense, that is, essentializing Semites in a pejorative way. In the time I have remaining, I want to do two things. First, celebrate what I view as positive and even exemplary in his biblical scholarship and his approach to texts in general. Second, critique some of the problematic attitudes, such as the one just alluded to, that are evident in these two books under consideration. I believe there's much to learn from both the favorable and the unfavorable aspects of his work as we try to advance our own agenda of honest and mutually respectful interreligious engagement. Speaking personally, I wish I could have been a student of Duncan Black McDonald. Listening to him share his breadth and depth of knowledge about Western and Middle Eastern cultures. He displayed in his writings, and I assume in his classroom lectures, we have photos of some of those, a wide-ranging intellect that was at home in multiple historical periods as well as varied national cultures and literature. He was a trained classicist, fluent in Biblical Hebrew, New Testament Greek, and Latin, with the added dimension of expertise in Arabic language and literature. He loved to draw parallels and occasionally contrast between Hebrew and Greek thought, as well as analogies between the Hebrew and Arabic languages and their cultural contexts. For example, when describing the psalmist and monarch David, quote, a many-sided man, a great lover, almost a romantic lover, a great warrior, a man of counsel and purposed plan, a man of wide experience in the adversities and successes of life, a man of close friendships, a man who slipped and fell and rose and went on, a great sinner and a great repenter a man whose passions were strong and burned high. And he goes on, he concludes that all of these rich personality traits, quote, must have been expressed in his songs, for he was plainly of the type that must express itself, unquote. And he adds, if there's any truth at all in the analogy illustrated throughout this book between the Hebrew and Arab literary minds, he must have had a diwan, a collection of his poems arranged and divided into books according to their subjects. And these would go out as songs in the ears and on the voices of the people and would be the models on which the singers of the future would shape their own songs." End of quote. Then MacDonald proceeds to draw, quote, a very close parallel, close quote, with a heroic figure in Arabic literature, the King Erin Imer al Qais. Though Imam al Qais was neither a religious man like David, nor ultimately a successful one, McDonald notes nevertheless, quote, he was in brain, blood, and bone, a singer, and he left behind him his diwan, poems which have been the norm for Arab verse ever since, end of quote. McDonald then tells some of, his, some of his desert chieftain and wanderer's story, punctuated with some of his lyrical verse, concluding, so is the tale, and all Arabia knows the lines. After offering this literary analogy, MacDonald returns to his primary subject, 
King David, and he writes, But of David, alas, we have no such diwan. The later generations, jealous for the reputation of the sainted king, saw to that. We have the great mass of religious songs in the Psalter, apocryphally ascribed to him, and which tell us only that he, like Imr al Qais, on very different material, struck out an individual genre and fixed its law of content and phrasing. But fortunately, the compiler of our books of Samuel has included some poems in which we can feel the real personality of David and find some clue to what his influence must have been. Possibly elsewhere, in the wide anonymity of the Old Testament, there are other fragments of his. His impress may even lie on that strange, erotic jumble which we call the Song of Songs. This excerpt is vintage Duncan Black MacDonald. Whether you agree with his argument or not, you have to marvel at his daring attempt to link, at least in his reader's mind, a biblical king and an Arabian poet singer, and to speculate that some more genuine songs of David were deliberately suppressed or even censored by later editors. As a Bible scholar, his distinct methodology is one of linguistic and cultural detective work. Equipped with a mastery of biblical Hebrew, a holistic view of the entire Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, which Finkel alluded to, and familiarity with the Greek Septuagint, Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate, and their discrepancies with the Hebrew original, he searches for clues or hidden keys to solve puzzles presented by the text, the Hebrew text and its message. In the above illustration, he is searching for the real David, quote, if it be possible, unquote, which he humbly qualifies, to reconstruct him. He tries to discern meanings often neglected or obscured by mistranslations or motives either behind biblical characters' actions or behind the writers who portrayed them. And along the way, he includes references to English or French or German literature, especially romantic poetry, folklore from various cultures, and even quantum physics. Nuggets from any field of study that he can enlist to bolster his grand intellectual scheme, a word he uses often. I find MacDonald most perceptive and helpful, especially to non-Jewish students of the Hebrew Bible, when he points out how mistranslations of the original text either lose or distort its essential meaning. Here I want to highlight one instance where his, philolo his philological fidelity to the Hebrew generates profound insight. It's the self-disclosure of the divine through the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses asks for a name that he can bring back to the skeptical Hebrew slaves. Through, quote, a perversion of the meaning of verse 14, which began with the Greek version and has continued ever since, unquote. The conventional English Bible records God's response as, I am what I am, or I am who I am. Whereas the expression in the Hebrew text is actually in the future tense. I will be who I will be, or in McDonald's rendering, I become what I become. There are Midrashic rabbinic commentaries of this text which McDonald apparently didn't know since he omits them. In what appears on the surface to be a tautology, the underlying idea conveyed by the three-word Hebrew name is of a divine personality changing in a dynamic way, at least partly in response to events in creation, especially the actions of human beings. This notion is developed in the second chapter of his second book, which is entitled A Philosophy of Becoming. And there are parallels with this evocative, uh, with, there are parallels of this evocative spiritual concept in the Jewish mystical tradition. Contemporary examples are David Cooper's book, God is a Verb, and Arthur Green's book, A Yet a Kabbalah for Tomorrow. There are also parallels in Whiteheadian process philosophy and theology. McDonald's essential aim in both volumes, to which he dedicates himself with all his powers, is to redeem the image of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and to demonstrate that the ancient Hebrews were as philosophically sophisticated as iconic Greek masters like Plato and Aristotle, or as literarily gifted as Homer and Virgil, 
with all the important differences between the Hebraic, the Hebraic and the Greco-Roman worlds. He considers his project an attack, his work, an attack on widely prevalent dogmas and prejudices regarding the intellectual, cultural, and artistic inferiority of the ancient Hebrews. In the prologue to the first volume, he writes, I am well aware that this book will be strange and even repellent to two very different classes of readers. To the specialist in Old Testament criticism, it will seem unscientific and even visionary. And to the worthy people for whom their Bible is still sacred scripture, capital S, S, and the Word of God, capital W, G, it may well seem destructive of their basis for eternal truth and even frivolous. To these last, let me say that I am far nearer their position than they may at first think, and that the specialist may quite possibly classify me and my book as reactionary. The truth, I think, is that while all precise doctrines of inspiration and inerrancy in any degree at all have for me gone by the board, I have come more and more to recognize an eternal purpose in the history of the Hebrew people and a unique guidance behind them and in them. For me, a believing and practicing Jew, it is very heartening to read a statement such as the following. Quote, Across the minds of the Hebrews there came the mystery of creative genius in words, and the things which they so created were of a kind that refuses to die. Unquote. When contrasted, for example, with the view of the historian Arnold Toynbee, who believed that Jews were a distinct race existing or persisting as a fossilized relic, encountering praise for Jewish genius from a Christian scholar of McDonald's caliber, caliber is reassuring, even if he, like Toynbee, also viewed the Hebrews and Jews today as a race. This unfortunate distortion of the ethnography and history, since Jews are a multiracial people, is an all too common misperception that sadly seemed too pervasive and persuasive for even the nonconformist McDonald to challenge. Let's now consider some more serious problems with his worldview and his interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures. In the first chapter of the Hebrew literary genius, he asserts, quote, the Hebrews, it has become plain, were simply an Arab clan which, under strange and unique guidance, entered Palestine and settled there. But they remained Arab, although they denounced the name. And their literature throughout all their history and to this day, in its methods of production and its recorded forms, is of Arab scheme and type." Unquote. He never substantiates this odd assertion regarding the origins of the Hebrew slash Israelite slash Jewish people, Moreover, he argues, quote, when the literature of the Hebrews is considered as to the literary types which it contains, the key is to be found in the far wider Arabic literature, unquote. This is a case of literary and cultural parallelism stretched to the point of fabricated pseudo-history. It's also the shadow or the negative side of a generally commendable scholarly aspiration to find linguistic clues or keys to an intellectual puzzle. Why not, for example, posit that Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic, if not other Semitic languages, developed from an Ur Semitic tongue spoken by a prehistoric Middle Eastern tribe or people, which then differentiated itself geographically, culturally, and eventually theologically? Could it be that in McDonald's case, his Orientalist fascination with Arabs, Arabic, and Islam trumped his otherwise pro Hebraic predilections? Or perhaps there remained in him some remnants of conditioned anti-Jewish prejudice? After all, he repeatedly calls the ancient Hebrews, as well as the pre-Islamic desert Arabs, whom he deems cousins in blood and form of life, that is, the Hebrews and the Arabs, he calls both primitive peoples compared to Western heirs to the heritage of Greece and Rome and the spiritual truth of Christianity. Beyond this stance of cultural and theological superiority, with regard to Semitic peoples generally, McDonald is himself heir to millennia old stereotypes of Hebrews and Jews in particular. He clearly prefers the most universalist books in the Tanakh, namely Genesis, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Ruth, and above all Ecclesiastes. 
He devotes most of his analytical brilliance to discerning the artistic and philosophical merits in these parts of the Old Testament. Other parts of the Tanakh are evidently too particularistic for him, or too burdened by moralistic exhortations, and he glosses over them or he ignores them completely. He considers the author of Genesis to be a great literary philosopher, but Exodus, even with its high drama of the deliverance from slavery and the giving of the Torah at Sinai, has little appeal for MacDonald, either as literary critic or theologian. He writes, Genesis is a great artistic whole. Exodus consists of a chaotic debris of brilliant fragments of historical romances. Unquote. For him, the narrative in Exodus is, quote, jumbled, broken, repeated, to the despair of commentators, unquote, an anonymous company of scholars in which he evidently places himself. He cites two verses describing one of the ten plagues that afflicted the Egyptians, the fiery hail, and then he offers a commentary that illustrates both the charm and the problematic nature of his idiosyncratic approach to the biblical text. If I had time, I would read it straight from the book. It's, it's worth getting this book off Amazon, as I did, and reading it. He's trying to figure out, like a, de like a detective, how the Jews were taken over by the marvels of Egypt during slavery, and he couldn't figure out how it really fit together until he was riding through the streets of Cairo, 1908, and his donkey boy told him romantic stories which he says he must have picked up in the coffee houses, you know, in the Khan al or wherever he was. <laughs> oh, Fishawi, one of the places where I've been to. Uh, and he says, this, that was it, the key came to me. You have to read it, you really have to read it. So based on, on this text, I say, there is dubious value in such a speculative methodology. I'm trying to be fair here, that's probably an understatement. Searching for interpretive clues in exotic and often extraneous sources. But there are larger problems, especially for interfaith relations, posed by the theological lens, lens through which MacDonald reads the Hebrew Bible. He states repeatedly that both the law, meaning the Pentateuch, which is a mistranslation of Torah going back to the Septuagint's nomos, which MacDonald uncharacteristically adopts and perpetuates. The law and the prophets are less philosophically edifying or literarily commendable. Toward the beginning of the second volume, he writes, quote, the fundamental Hebrew conception of a God who reveals himself to every human soul can still hold for us and can be hold for us and can be made the basis of a sound philosophical theology even when the law revealed in the mount and the time-limited rhapsodies of the Hebrew prophets have ceased to have weight or meaning for us." Unquote. So here, I for one detect echoes or remnants of long-standing Christian caricatures of Jews and Judaism as legalistic and ethnocentric. Indeed, on several occasions, he decries the, quote, ferocious nationalism that characterized the Hebrews. For example, when he mentions the book of Esther, he compares it to the Arabian Nights, which we heard of earlier. He finds both deriving from a folklore tale in India, working its way westward through Persia, yielding these two literary descendants, namely Esther and the Knights. Regarding Esther, he writes, quote, the Hebrew of that book is very peculiar and suggests that it has been tra translated from some non-Semitic language. Persian, it may be. It evidently owes its place in the Hebrew canon to its ferociously nationalistic character and to its association with the Feast of Purim, unquote. Another conventional stance within Christian tradition, which MacDonald adopts uncritically in his reading of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, is to see the old prefiguring the new revelation and dispensation in Jesus Christ. Nothing new or surprising here. In fact, he prefaces his second volume, The Hebrew Philosophical Genius, with the Nicene Creed, in case any reader might wonder where his theological convictions and loyalties lie. Now, even if I disagree with his theology and the way he fashions from it a Christological lens to read my and our sacred scripture, I value the honesty with which he does this. 
In his epilogue to the second book, he, wrote, he writes, quote, apart from the vindication of the philosophical genius of the Hebrews, it has been an object of this book to draw attention to a thread of derivation and development of Trinitarian doctrine, which is too often neglected, unquote. I praise him for putting it out there. It's important to know in a dialogue where the other person stands. His reference here is what he views as a personification of reason, which he finds in certain passages in the Old Testament, especially Proverbs chapter 8, and by theological extension with that divine logos, I'm sorry, a divine quality associated with the logos in the first verses of John's Gospel, and by theological extension with that divine logos or word incarnate in Christ. I'm generally very appreciative of his faithfulness to Biblical Hebrew and his efforts to counter the distortions caused by mistranslations, but I am not persuaded by his extended argument in favor of chokhmah, usually rendered in English as wisdom, being read as reason. For MacDonald, reason is an eternal aspect of the divine revealing itself or herself, since chokhmah is feminine, through nature and the human soul. Independently of divine commandments or guidance communicated through the biblical prophets. This reason is an eternal being that was with God before the world was and who now through the very structure of the world seeks to reach men and to teach them and give them the true abiding life. That was a quote. In this interpretive scheme or paradigm, I see reflected a form of Protestant individualism, a priesthood of all believers, trumping communitarian norms for ethical behavior. So overall, I believe that Duncan Black MacDonald serves as a fascinating, brilliant, if flawed, humanly flawed exemplar in the enterprise we now call interfaith engagement. He saw wisdom everywhere, and he could draw on cultural and literary sources from a wide variety of cultures and historical epochs. As an educator, sharing the fruits of his intellectual labors, he was honest, and courageous, not afraid to challenge received opinion. He was at heart a romantic who truly loved storytelling, whether in folkloristic tales or sacred scriptures. And in my experience as an interfaith educator, stories, whether personal or collective, are a better foundation for interfaith dialogue and relationships than doctrines or creeds. So I have to end with a story that he tells. It's a passage taken from a chapter in the Hebrew literary genius that bears the enticing title, The Hebrews and the Weird, <laughs> by which he means the unseen or the supernatural. After contrasting the ancient Hebrew and Greek conceptions of the otherworldly, he focuses on the great story in Daniel chapter 5 of Belshazzar's feast and of the doom pronounced on him. He says, the whole story should be read for the consummate art with which it is told from the beginning. Was there ever in history a Chaldean king, Belshazzar? There are grave doubts, he writes, but there are no doubts that his story belongs to great literature and in it he lives and will live forever. Why has the story so tremendous an effect? Here's how he answers it. In part, it is the art with which it is developed, but above all, it is the mystery and terror of the handwriting on the wall. This is going to sound like a dragon poem. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, now he's quoting from Daniel, and they were writing over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. But the king was seeing only the part of the hand that was writing, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then from before him was sent the part of the hand, and this writing was written. That's the end of the textual quote. And the rest is made down. It was the fingers only that came, but the writing remained and remains. There is no other writing on any wall that has had such effect as this. And its working is that the sudden immediate contact with the unseen suggests such vast, untold, and untellable possibilities. 
gaping with Belshazzar at that wall, we are also standing, quote, silent upon a peak, as Cortez in Keats's great sonnet, here he's quoting, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, as Cortez in Keats's great sonnet, with all the ocean of the unseen before us, it is the silent form that teases us out of thought. It is the unheard melody that is the sweetest of all. And the untold mysteries of the unseen brought thus in momentary dignity before us have more effect upon us than the plastic beauty of detail in the Greek world. For us as romantics, a touch on that nerve is all we need. <laughs> Yes. Yeah.